little over two years ago, we were all awaiting the mess that would likely be Sonic the Hedgehog. Shockingly, many people came out of the film pleasantly surprised that they enjoyed a video game movie made for kids. Is that because people went in with such low expectations that it wasn't difficult to exceed them? I don't know. But I do know that I am one of those people who walked out of my cinema on Valentine's Day 2020 elated about the date I just had with Sonic. Reigniting my love for the franchise that faded away after the release of Sonic Generations in 2011. I began to reminisce my time getting frustrated at Sonic 06, the excitement I got from unwrapping Sonic Sonic Socks on Christmas. Sonic Socks! Making my mum buy me all these DVDs and comics. That time I got sucked through an interdimensional wormhole and merged with Sonic to become one godlike being preventing the end of all universes. But most of all, vibing out to the soundtracks of the game. Now I love the Sonic movie. Marston is charming, they found a nice line between Knucklehead Eggman and Intimidating Eggman for Carrie, and Ben Schwartz perfectly encapsulates the snarky confidence of Sonic without the writing coming off as cringy or rude like it can do in the games, with a serviceable yet entertaining turn your brain off story to backdrop it. But I feel there's one key element missing to make it a superb adaptation of the games, and that is the music. Despite all the criticism the Sonic franchise has gotten over the years, one thing that even outsiders of the Sonic fanbase appreciate is that every game delivers an amazing distinctive soundtrack. Meanwhile, the film gets this. I don't know, are we sure this is Sonic music? I mean, yeah, it, it's gotta be, it says it, it's right there. Yeah, I know, but it just... Oh, wait. Oh my god, we did the wrong game! The music of Sonic games has evolved over the years and taken on many forms, starting out with more of a synthesized electropop, which although restricted by hardware limitations of the Sega Genesis, became very memorable. However, Sonic CD had a soundtrack with a clear New Jack Swing influence which became very unique thanks to the Sega CD's enhanced sound chips, and this game kind of set the precedent for all future Sonic soundtracks to follow. All good Sonic music should be able to parallel the very essence of Sonic the Hedgehog, which is his super speed, especially in a racing game. Sonic R on the Sega and added yet another voice to the franchise by echoing French disco pop of the 90s. Richard Jacques does a great job of composing these instrumentals, but TJ Davis's radiant vocals spark motivation inside of me that makes every run I go on listening to this soundtrack feel otherworldly, even though playing the game does not feel like that at all. Then the final Sega console came along, and with it, Sonic Adventure, which spawned the loudest voice of the franchise thanks to Jun Sonoe's love for rock and roll. Although experimenting with grunge before, the sound of Sonic quickly became rock with a kick of funk behind it, and that kinda stuck as I continue to market this cool, modern 3D Sonic with Sonic Adventure 2, which holds, I believe, the most iconic song from the franchise, other than, you know, Green Hill Zone, Escape from the City by Ted Poley and Tony Harnell. A brilliant opening to the game due to the catchy rhyming scheme and harsh guitar. It's yet another upbeat song which is great to run to, and the same goes for the Cash Cash remix it received for Sonic Generations. And the theme of the game, acting as the final boss music, Live and Learn by Crush 40, is an inspiring but rock track to culminate this story with. However, the soundtrack doesn't just stop at hard rock, as each character has a unique sound. For example, Shadow Stages were more of an industrial rock by leaning into technical percussions, and Knuckle Stages were backed by mellow hip-hop tracks to reflect his calm gliding. Sonic Heroes soundtrack is also a mashup of genres, but this time separated by the stages instead of character, which evoke summer vibes. <laughs> uh, for me at least. A few years pass, and we get Sonic 06, which overall was a, was a very bad it was a very bad thing, actually. It's commonly cited as the worst video game of all time, and likely the biggest reason why Sonic is always the butt of the joke among gamers. As I alluded to earlier, it came out with a plethora of issues, which in some cases render it unplayable. I for one have never completed it, I, ju I just couldn't. But it can be argued it was all worth it for the soundtrack. Once again, a great mesh of genres, but the title screen features the instrumental of His World by Tomoya Otani, which generates a feeling of fear, as well as aspiration 
exploration as Sonic now takes on more of an orchestral voice to mirror the more realistic world and daunting story this game tried to create. After Sonic 06, they needed to rebuild their reputation and thankfully kept Otani on board to be sound director for their next mainline entry, Sonic Unleashed, which has the best soundtrack the franchise has to offer and unironically, one of the most amazing pieces of music I've ever listened to. No matter the mood I'm in, I could be running, I could be working or just chilling out, it's incredible to hear. It's idiosyncratic experimentation makes each stage an absolute joy to play, and that's because each country you go to in the game has its own sound to it. You start off in Apatos. The song Windmill All Day is my favourite of the series. Not only does it give the exhilarating sense of speed Sonic has as you blow through the stage by reversing the snares, but the acoustic guitar and violin perfectly represent the calming atmosphere of this gorgeous seaside town. This is then followed by the hub world music which is beautifully soothing and even makes me anticipate these weird text boxes on the Wii version. Then you get the nighttime stages which are typically less up beat as it reflects Sonic being in this horrifying state he doesn't want to be in, and despite these levels being painfully long on the Xbox 360 version, the music keeps it enjoyable. Rooftop Run Day from Spagonia is a wonderful meshing of musical styles from across Europe while still matching Sonic's high speeds. This track received two great remixes for Sonic Generations, one that adds piano for modern Sonic and one that adds a more electronic tone for classic Sonic to represent the series' musical roots. Unleashed doesn't just stick to orchestral rock, as Arid Sands Day focuses more on drums to match the fictional Egypt setting and Chun Nan Night also embraces its fictionalised China setting by using an Erhu to make a peacefully enchanting track that both gets me excited and sleepy. The final boss music, however, fully leans into the orchestral side of the soundtrack, which works really well by giving it a more ethereal sound to create a both daunting and encouraging track. Even though the Wii version of this boss is incredibly hard for some reason, even after two hours it never got tiring and instead kept pushing me to continue as it made me feel the weight on Sonic's shoulders. I'm gonna stop here because this soundtrack perfectly encapsulates what Sonic music should be and the movie should have borrowed from it. And I think a significant reason as to why it didn't is because the biggest thing we've seen from the Sonic soundtracks is the sheer amount of variety in each one due to the fact that most Sonic games are globetrotting adventures chock full of distinguishable characters. But in the film, there's only Sonic and we're really only in one place. Except for the final battle between Eggman and Sonic, which plays the semi-appropriately named track SF to Paris to Egypt to SF, as we follow Sonic and Eggman through portals to different countries. The music remains the same all throughout. This was a perfect opportunity to start with a rock song as Escape from the City's level is clearly inspired by San Francisco, move over to something more like Rooftop Run when he reaches Paris, something like the Chinese-inspired Dragon Road from Unleashed when he's on the Great Wall of China, and then Arid Sand when he's in Egypt, but instead they opt for a song that is far too orchestral and due to the high peak Sonic music has reached before, it ends up sounding like a generic score from any action movie from the past 40 years which doesn't at all capture the very essence of Sonic, his super speed, which as I said earlier is what any good Sonic track, used in this context at least, should do. Now, I'm aware it's an adaptation, so it doesn't need to be the exact same as the source material, but when it's such a beloved aspect of the games and adds to the iconography of the franchise, I mean, even the TV shows have very memorable songs, you kind of need to do something similar to that. Which, to Junkie XL's credit, there are flashes of it. Welcome to Green Hills is a great mesh of electro, rock, and piano, the three main sounds of the franchise, as the latter was heavily used in Sonic Colors and Lost World. But this is the only glimpse of Sonic appropriate music, and the rest of the score I mean, it's perfectly fine. For a different film. I mean, they've made some great music in their career as a film composer. For example, their song At the Speed of Force in the Snyder Cut is a great orchestral rock song with a hint of punk to match the Flash, which is really thematically similar to Sonic when you think about it. So is this a sign that the soundtrack to Sonic the Hedgehog 2 will be better than the originals? I think it might be. In addition to the fact that it introduces Tails and Knuckles in a film which is marketed to be more of a world trekking adventure to hopefully make room for more distinctive upbeat tracks. So I'm gonna go see it and find out. Would have been fine if they called it Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and Knuckles, but oh well, it's fine. It's fine. I don't care. It that de it, to it definitely doesn't annoy me. N not at all. Okay, maybe just a- Yeah, a few hours ago I saw Sonic 2, about three hours ago. I'm not gonna review it. But I liked it! Some people don't like to watch trailers because spoilers and... And even if spoilers weren't an issue, uh, there's... I can't show correlating footage because... The big P. So I'm just gonna be cutting back to this ugly face. Uh, but yeah. So was the music in Sonic the Hedgehog 2, 2022, mo mo the second movie, live action, was it any better?
I'm, I'm sure if I like went on Spotify and listened to the original score by itself, I'd be able to distinguish each song f from each other. But each song that played just felt like an extension of the one that came before it. And not in like an artistic way, just in a way where it's just, they all meshed together and sounded like the same generic orchestral superhero genre m s music. Towards the end, there was a like a riff. It was like the beginning of like a, a hard rock song, and it was like, oh my god, this is like you know Sonic. This is giving me Sonic Adventure 2 vibes. And then it just cut off and went straight back into generic or orchestral music, which first of all just felt weird. Like it was an awkward. Cut. And like yeah, sure, the score works fine in the context of the film, but not in the context of it being a Sonic film. You know, like I'm sure if I heard this music in some other film, it would actually elevate the material and make me feel something, but with this it just... We've seen what Sonic music can be, and I don't like this variation of it because it doesn't sound like Sonic music. And also even aside from that, there was just there were just so many licensed songs for some reason reason, very, very minor spoilers, there's a dance scene in this film to the song Uptown Funk, that song from eight years ago which I don't think anyone actually liked, although I will forgive it because Sonic does strike a very iconic pose which which, which made me go, oh I know that! But yeah, it was, it was just kind of disappointing. And yeah, maybe this is just like the new step. You know, like it started out with like electro pop, you know, that kind of in a way kind of represents Sonic's childhood innocence, and then it transformed into like hard rock to represent Sonic's edgy phase because you know Sonic is only like 15, or, or at least in the first couple of games. And um, I, t I told I told you not to come in here when I'm filming. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so you said Sonic is 15. Uh, yeah, yeah. In the games, he's 15. And then in the movies, it's, it's it's expected that he's actually a little bit younger, like 13 or 14, mm. maybe. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, because uh, cause earlier, I could have I sworn you said something that, like you you went on a date with him? Uh, yeah, no, that that was a joke. Okay, <laughs> okay, wow. So you think the other big P is funny? <laughs> what? No, that would, that was a self-deprecating joke pointing out how lonely and unhappy... What's in there? <laughs> Uh, no one's in there. I didn't say who. Hopefully the music for the third Sonic movie will match the high quality of the games. It would be nice if they just got Crush 40 to do a song, or you know, make Tomoya Otani compose something for it. It just really bugs me how they are missing out one of the key defining elements of the games that everyone loves and have failed to realise that. And that's what I believe is the biggest problem with the Sonic movies.